is going to kind of be all in-house, so we're going to be using our own information. So we'll start off with introductions. I'm Charlie. K oh, we got one guy coming here. Mr. Greg, we'll wait for him. But um, lots of things been happening this summer with field day. 21, I think, we had stations going. A few of those made CQ calls but didn't raise anybody, so, but it still counts. So, I think they did one, didn't they, Charlie? Well, 160, I don't think <coughs> any made any, uh, yes, did. all they did. Oh, but two meters didn't. Okay. On sideband. Oh, somebody want to let him in? No, it's the What's it? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. All right. Mr. Steve. Hey, Steve. Just leave the door locked. Yeah. Hurry up, hi, you Okay. I'm Charlie, KC0CD. KD9CJX. Tom, KD0HF. Daniel, WA6. KC0DM, Tim. Larry, AB0QS. Gary, KZ0GT. Joe, FEB0YFL. Gary, FEB0YY. Woo. Then send to AIE. Christopher, KC0YGW. Uh, Tom, Mike, we KC0PB. Greg, KC0SCAM. Bob, Henry, KD0, Nathan, KD0, Nathan, 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 we had $8,000 in the account, and we received money from Rockwell. There was some discussion, uh, because what I had submitted last summer, uh, they were a little upset because it came up to about 56 bucks per member. They said, that's more than anybody else is getting. Well, I wasn't too sure about that because there was more than that for the... Um, Museum Club, which I'm a member, there's 12 members and they get some money. So anyway, um, I said, well, we can cut some stuff off. So I started to say, well, let's take this off and take that off and take the, because I had things in there like replacing the gnarly looking ro carpet on the floor with new squares and uh, several other things like that. So I started whipping those off and he finally says, okay, okay, wait, let's add up what you have left. So what is left on the list, the big items, was the a uh, couple thousand dollars for the operation of the stations. Uh, that include the DSL line, the, uh, yeah. And um, basically a replacement of one of the flex machines with a 6700 or 6500. Uh, I contacted the, uh, the flex guys who were having a trade in. Well, you could trade in your 5000 version for a 60. X, X version. And they would give us $1,200 for the one in the uh, 112 station. And well, that's not much. But it cuts it down considerable because I think they're asking 42 or 43 for the 65. Um, <clears throat> but it is, you know, we'd like to have the latest available. And the top two uh, radios in uh, Sherwood's test is the 6700, which is the same as the 6500, and the K3. So, you know, I mean, if we get that, but we basically put that in, and Rockwell makes a big deal about spending them. If you say you're going to get this, then you have to spend that money on that. So we had about $8,000 in the pot uh, before, and they added another eight to it. That's what it got down to. The other expensive items were the, uh, whatever, $150 for the controller for the step antennas. Uh, at the end of this, I have why that's important for these new controllers. Uh, I'll, I'll explain then because I got some pictures to help that out. So 
the, the, the pending things that we're, we're not sure about. We got billed for $8,060 to install all those antennas down at main plant. And I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but, you know, I mean, they brought out a monster crane. They didn't, it wasn't heavy. It had to reach across the building, the Butler buildings, to get to the tower. And I was watching that happen. I thought, man, I really didn't want to stand on the top of that tower and gin pull that thing up. The problem was the mast that was there had a reducer and a union on it. So we couldn't remove the rotor and just lower it down, taking pieces off as we lowered it down. I don't know how it was put in there. Somebody stood on the top of that thing and stood it up with all the antennas on it and shoved it down the hole. <laughs> I couldn't find anybody that was willing to do that. <laughs> yeah, but you had to stand that. I guess they put it up by throwing it up in the middle. You know, that'd be before the 20 years of rust and set in. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, maybe they put that in and push it out. Anyway, so we decided, no, we're not going to. So we hired it out. And while it was out there, the, uh, it turned out the log periodic wasn't working either at the, on, on the higher frequencies. So the elements they had removed and put back on before they lifted it up there were working fine, but anything above 18 was not working because they hadn't taken those off. So they lay, they, they opened up the bucket and the guy was tied off and he was hanging out of the bucket on top of the log periodic working on the thing there at a hundred feet in the air. <laughs> okay, so they got that working. Um, so Mike will give us some more rundown on that. So that, that was fun. So anyway, yes. Which one's that? The uh, $8,060 that was built No, it was built to clubs and leagues. We used a regular Rockwell internal order, in, in, internal order to pay for that. So the th they may come to us and say, but they haven't yet. Okay. We used the same number we used when we put up the uh, verticals for the, the D-Star station on top of that 300-foot tower, and we never heard anything about it. So we're just kind of being real quiet, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so that's, that's what the funding deal is. The Rockwell money, $8,000, has to be spent this year on the things we said we would spend it on. So those are the three major items we will spend them on. There's a new radio and two new controllers. Um, so we have been, you know, getting a lot of information out there for folks, so that's good. What else do we have listed here? That was the clubs and leagues. Um, the North Station whispers up. Periodically it shuts itself off. So if you just go out to whispernet.com or uh, you can see in zero CXX and you can see the uh, what three watts can do when it's encoded. It's, you know, you'll see minus 17. That doesn't mean you can talk to somebody in California just because that station on three watts is talking to California. If it's minus 17, that means 17 dB below the noise floor. Um, the transmitter on the S line is not working. The receiver works. All the antennas are up, come in and use the station. There is some things that can be done. We can check out and hook up the second stack of HF80 if somebody really is interested in that. The edge of the antenna from the base of the 300 foot tower over to the station where we have uh, D star or the DSL line hits the edge of the building. So we need to push that thing up about another 10 feet and then it'll clear the top of the building and we can have uh, consistent Action. It's been working pretty well from what I understand. Sure. Yo. So, has anybody else, uh, has anybody been on D Star of late and tried the internet connection? No. I haven't. No, I haven't. Why do you ask? How, how many people here have D Star? All 
four of us. <laughs> As I heard somebody on the air last week describe the, somebody I was talking about, and they said the Cedar Rapids D-Star thing, the local repeater work of the internet had problems, and I don't know if that was new news or old news or it, it, continuing. It comes and goes. I understand. Yeah. So if we get this up a little higher, then it should stay connected. We hope. But that has to be done. Uh, there is a 150 watt amplifier, hey, that's not spelt right, uh, that could be hooked to the, the K3. The K3 has the UHF or VHF module in it. At this point, that's the only uh, VHF radio, uh, sideband type radio, that is in the North Station. We've got two FM type, well, we've got a D Star radio and, and two analog FM radios there also. So. Yes. And we would like to get connected to the K3. The K3 doesn't do. It's a, I, uh, it, well, yeah, we can get an external. Yep, that work. We could do that. So. Or just get the two meters. Ahead. This is uh, what is happening down a main plant, and Mike's going to take her from here. Let me turn you into a, let's see, you get hold on, one for the. We'll try not to sneeze on this one here. Give me that. What's that guy you do? Is this guy on? Yeah, I think it's on. And then you turn that on, and he can record you there, and that one drops okay. in your other pocket. Okay, does well. It say, does it say it's on? It's not muted. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, all right, so for the past. Oh my God, how long has it been? Five, six, thank you. Which, which one is the uh, up, down for slides and there's a, la mm -hmm. and there's a laser pointer? And you're right above it. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool, all right, <laughs> don't look. All right, thank you. Okay, so for the past five, six years, we've been slow rolling and finally getting the, uh, to get the main plant station back up and operational, and it is. So what this is here is this is a listing of everything that is up and running and operational and working at main plant. So the HF, the, anten the antennas on the left and the HF uh, equipment on the right. So we could do multiple ops if we wanted to. And I'll go through part of the presentation I'm giving here is a little quick nickel tour rundown of the main plant station. So when you walk in, and you see this collage of stuff. Okay, how, how do I turn on the radio and start talking to somebody? So I'm going to give a quick rundown of that because uh, through Charlie's efforts, it's really been uh, streamlined quite a bit if, for the guy who wants to come in and run, especially, uh, f especially for single op type, type communications. It's, it's really uh, pretty straightforward and easy to do if you know which things you have to turn on. So I'll talk about that. So. <clears throat> Five HF antennas, I'm including in there the log periodic, which we can use on request from the Jeep lab, provided they don't have anything going on over the weekend. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, I was just talking to Greg on the side here a moment ago. Uh, one of the earlier slides, um, I had mentioned that there's a, there's a South American Sprint Contest coming up, and it's this Saturday. Um, I don't know if any of you are big contesters or not. I don't know, those that have done contests, I don't know if you've ever done a sprint contest, but it's vastly different than, say, sweepstakes or, or CQ Worldwide or anything like that. It only runs for two hours, that's it, and it's fairly fast paced and it's a lot of fun. Uh, the, yeah, the big difference is they employ the QS, what they call the QSY rule. You have to change frequencies. In other words, most contests, if there's a frequency open, I can start calling CQ and people come back to me and I keep running that frequency. And I, as long as I don't have to go to the bathroom or sleep, I can just keep running that frequency. In this contest, you have this frequency, you call CQ, someone comes back to you, you make your contact, do your exchange, and you say, all right, it's your frequency now and you move somewhere else. That guy calls CQ one time, a bunch of people come back to him or her, they make a contact and he says, okay, now it's your frequency. And so what happens, is you, you only can make two contiguous contacts on that frequency. You have to move at least five kilohertz after making two contacts, and there's a minimum amount of time before you can reuse that frequency again. So what's, what's neat about it is that this contest, like a lot of other ones, is that you get points based on total number of contacts 
and a multiplier, although the multiplier is the most unique countries, okay? So like for example, I ran the North American Sprint Contest last year for Maine Plant, and there, I didn't have Australia yet, and I heard, a, I heard an Aussie talking, right? Well, the problem is, so you get on the frequency where he is, and he calls CQ, and so you come back to him and say he grabs somebody else. Well, it's too late, he's moving on. So what you do is you get, you get a feel for, you start listening, and most guys are just going up the band. They're going every five kilohertz till up on 20 meters, then back down again, and keep going, just like, in a, just like a platen on a typewriter. And so what you do is you get ahead of them. And here he comes, here he comes, here he comes, and you jump on him. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a twist to it. And, it, and, and, and even if you don't want the multipliers, if you just want to run, right, you have to get your brain a little bit different to, uh, he called CQ, he got me, I call CQ, I do one, okay, now I move. And you, your hand's on the VFO and you're just doing five kilohertz and you just keep going like that. And so you get into this rhythm after a while and um, it's a lot of fun. So I know Greg expressed some interest. I know Charlie, Charlie and I are gonna be there. So this is four o'clock to six o'clock in the afternoon, local time this Saturday. And we're going to be at Main Plant, and if uh, as Greg, if Greg had as Greg had mentioned, I'm going to talk to the guys in the Jeep Lab, and and this little guy right here on 40 meters is a barn burner, because you've got figure what three, maybe four elements working for you on a given band, sitting at 100 feet. So we're going to point that to South America and just run. So I'm going to try to get that one. If not, we'll use our new uh, uh, step by our beam, and, and we've got other, other options there as well. But that's coming up this Saturday, so anyone who wants to come out, and if someone hasn't done a contest before and wants to see what it's like, you know, some people get all serious about it. To me, it's just fun. And, and the best way to do it is just jump in and go. And uh, it is a lot of fun, and it really uh, get, get thinking quick on your feet. So I just want to put that out there for this Saturday. All right. Um, the last time, the last meeting that we had uh, three months ago, we said, yeah, it's mostly working, but we got some things at the station, one of which is the, the control for the step by our beam wasn't working. The, the, we had the, the network analyzer there, and we would tune it for 15 meters, and it was actually resonant like at uh, 23 megahertz or 19 megahertz. It was off. And so we were thinking the lightning arresters we used for the control cables might have been doing it, rainwater, something like that. Uh, no. So... It was, wires were pinched. So basically when we were hooking them up to the lightning arrestor, the spade logs, we got one wire in the adjacent nut and after we straightened it all out, it, it uh, tunes as advertised and actually it works fantastic. This, uh, this is a section of log over the course of a, a couple of weeks and there's just a few of them and you can see scattered, you know, the, what I, so most of these are my, are my operations and when I log, I try to be, you know, I'm not doing this for a contest. It's not 5959, five, repeat, 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 repeat. Okay, 59. <laughs> so the, I'm trying to give them, you know, legitimate readings, and these are all S7 or higher, and a lot of these are 20 to 30 dB over. I mean, this thing, this, this uh, step by our beam is like a laser in the fog, because I, I had one in particular I wanted to call out, see if I can find him. Uh, it was either this Russian contest or the Croatian contest. One of these two, I can't remember what it was, but he had a big pile up. I could hear everybody around me coming back to him. And I fired up the alpha amplifier and once it warmed up and I did one call W0CXX and he came right back to me. So this thing really cuts through. So the beam works great and this helps. So if you guys wanna have a lot of fun and life's too short for QRP, uh, the Alpha 87 that we've got in there is a really nice amplifier. This is the one that's basically perma-connected, if you will. We have it mated with the 10 Tech Orion radio. That's just the way we have it configured. That doesn't mean we can't change it around, but that's how it's set up. So this one is a lot of fun to use, and you definitely put a big signal out. Okay, so now that I say that everything is working, that was an engineer saying it's working working with caveats. So there's some, some rough edges we have to smooth out with our installation. Um, I mentioned before the satellite uh, beams are up, but we need to remount them and fix the azimuth control. We just haven't gotten around to that, but that, that's still on the plate to, 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 to get knocked off. Um, one thing we found out by running a contest is that the VHF contest that was a few weeks ago, Charlie and I ran, and uh, I think, and a couple others ran out of the main plant station 
And what we found out is this ICOM 271. Now this is a two meter radio that we've had for about 20, 25 years, which I've used in the past for local repeater operation. FM works great, terrible on sideband. So if someone wants to dig into it, because I got reports and Greg can confirm this because he was out roving. It, it's terrible on its transmit voice quality and its receive quality. So I don't know if we've got a power supply that's warbling. I don't know what it is, but sideband is terrible. So we have something else to work on for that. Um, the Flex 5000, what we also found out during the same contest is that on HF, it works great on six meters though. I mean, the receive audio level is unusably low. What I mean by that is Charlie had all the gain cranked up, all the settings for max audio, we had this, the desk speakers turned all the way up, and I had to put it up to my ear, tell everybody in the room to be quiet, and it was crystal clear. The guy was a nice, strong signal coming in. It was crystal clear audio, but just 60 dB low. I don't know why. And we would swap back to, like, say, 10 meters, and it was booming. So that needs to be, I don't know what, the, what all up is up with that. There may be a built-in preamp. Like six it drops in, that may be yeah. That might be the one to trade in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wanna buy a car? I like I like the way I like the way Barry thinks. One thing, somebody came up to me when this possibility of getting a new radio came up. They mm -hmm. said, hey, they wanted to buy whichever one we want to sell, so we would stay in the local area and soon as soon as we found that six didn't work, we probably would get in the road. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said, well, I never operate six, and we're good to go. Right? Take the money and run, yep. Yeah. So, okay, so that, so we need to look at that or trade it in however we, we, fi we fix the problem. Um, right. The last thing is the tower. The good part is that we have a chrome molly mast. The bad part is we have a chrome molly mast, and that's what I believe is the pro issue here, which is... But, I first noticed this about two months after we installed it. Now keep in mind when we had the guys from Tri-State Towers climb and go up in the basket, they'd put it up there and they had knocked into it and it knocked it off so they straightened it back out. And I watched the guys, I mean they're just torquing down the U-bolts to clamp the mast to the rotor. So they snugged it up good and tight. The thing's slipping. I mean here's an example, I don't know if you can read it, but that's, it was 25 degrees. These, this is a note that I have there in the station. A couple weeks ago it was 25 degrees off, then it was 35, now it's 55 degrees off. And so that thing is slipping within it. So what I've personally done in the meantime is that this, this controller has a nice little auto feature where you spin the dial, which will temporarily take the needle to say, where do you want me to go? Then you hit and release the brake and then it automatically takes care of everything for you. The di and I think what's exacerbating, I know big words, What's making this problem worse is the fact that when you do it that auto way, the first thing it does is in case the brake is seized up, it first kicks it one way, so it starts spinning, and then it kicks it back the other way. And I'm just wondering if that's not sliding, you know, I, I don't think that by itself would do it. And so that can be it, it can be, but we still need to climb up there and see because I don't think it's gripping good enough because that metal is so hard we have nothing to, to grip into. So I'm looking for, I've been kind of brainstorming, do we do some sort of adhesive wrap around it, something that, for that clamp to dig into? We could do that, but the thing that's really hard is the mast itself and it's going to be, and we could score that, but it's galvanized and I'd rather not do that. Yeah. Yeah, because the mass itself is really hard. I, I guarantee you that the clamps aren't digging into it. So we, we can talk the about this. Clamps are, the clamps are smooth also. Correct. No, they, have, they have little ridges in them. But the clip, the, the, the rotor has notching in it, but it's a hot metal. And so if you crank down on it too much, you're going to break the rotor. Yeah. So and we'll, they don't, they don't recommend Right. So we'll come up with, we'll come up with a, it's it just, suffice it to say, so the good news is that you don't have to walk that far out of the door of the main plant shack to get outside and look at it and get yourself calibrated for where it's pointed, which is what I do right now. So, But once you do get it pointed the way you want, it works great. Okay, so I'm going to go in now, basic station operation and an overview of it. And like I said, Charlie's spent a lot of time and effort into getting this, I won't say automated, but easy to use, but even easy to use 
can still be intimidating when you walk in and you see this. Now, this is my fee. One thing you didn't touch on is there's a power button right here. Yep. I'm going to turn on. I'm going to. Oh, you're going to do yeah, that? Yeah. Okay, so you didn't have to it, that. You, it wasn't in the slides. I need to talk to it, right? Oh, okay. Okay. So, when, so this is a view basically looking from the door when you walk in. This is my nice, nice stitching. But yeah, Photoshop and me don't get along. Um, so the KWM2 and 30L1s over here, the 271, which is on, and 471s are over on this desk here, the HF380 and the coffin tuner next to it, uh, Alpha 30, Alpha 87, which is mated with the or Tentec Orion, is here. We have a D-Star radio here with a uh, repeater list that's programmed in. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, a radio that may or may not be used for satellite communications, power meter, and the flex radio. And for anyone who's still an employee, uh, this computer is on the R, R web. So if, if you have a Collins login, you can do your stuff. Um, so when you come in, the, the way this works here is that, as Charlie had mentioned, right up at the top panel, there's a big red button and there's a smaller black one. You hit the black one, that puts power to everything. So when you go to leave, if you hit the big red button in the middle, everything is killed. There are only two things that aren't killed. Uh, the, um, the, Heath, the Heath kit clock and the R-Web PC. Uh, so it's always stayed up and running. Everything else is dead, though. Everything else is, power is killed to it. Oh, I'm sorry. And the Alpha um, PA, because that runs off of 240. So Please make sure when you leave, you punch that red button. If you punch the red button, all of the 110 volt AC single phase stuff is going to be off. Okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit on, this is a close-up of the rack. Again, at the top here, here's the big red uh, off button. There's a the little black on button. Um, and I'm going to talk, uh, in the coming slides, I'll, I'll walk my way down the rack here. So what we have at the top is our antenna patch panel. Now, this looks very familiar with what we've had in the past. What's added, and you can't see because it's inside the rack, is the Zato Lind Sphinx 8x1 single pole 8 throw switches that they made a couple years ago. We bought two of them and put them in here. So you've got a control box, which I will go into details here later. So from sitting down at one desk, you can switch between any, ra any HF radio and connect it up to any HF antenna without swapping cables. I found this useful just because it's been nice for me as I, I'll do an A-B comparison for antennas is the, how's the vertical sound compared to the beam, how's it sound, and you can do really quick comparisons that way. <clears throat> so the reason why you, okay, so you might say, well, Mike, if you've got these eight by one switches, why do you have this clap trap out here? Well, the eight by one switches are great if you have one operator, because again, it's any one radio to any one antenna and all the rest of them are, are not connected. So if I want to do two simultaneous operators or anything like that, I can re-cable the patch panels and go directly from a radio directly to an antenna and bypass the switch. Um, right below the red and blue panels is we have our two step IR controllers. The top one is for the uh, beam. Uh, the bottom one is for the vertical. Uh, the controller here to the right is the high gain controller for the rotor up on the tower. Just below that is an MFJ tuner, and I'll come in a later slide. I'll show where that's located in this whole uh, chain. And below that is the uh, uh, Alpha uh, 87 amplifier that's mated with the Tentec Orion, and a Rockwell PA671, which is hooked up with the HF380. So that is the list of equipment that is in this rack, where other than the individual radios at their individual stations and desks, everything else pretty much goes through this rack. So it's a one-stop shop uh, where the, on the back side, you'll see all of the uh, spade lugs for all of the control wires off to the rotors, and we have maps for which signal is connected where, and all the RF connections up front. Okay, off to the side, so that, so that was, okay, so if looking at the left side of the rack, you see this. And so what we've put up there is Charlie's put together the D-Star radio, which is just below this, where this picture is, is located right sitting on the desk right below where this uh, bottom edge of the picture. He's programmed in a slug of repeaters into the D-Star radio. So turn the knob, the display tells you so they're already preset for a lot of the local repeaters. Um, 
This is a chart that gives all the feed lines which are labeled inside the shack and which antennas they go to. This is a wiring diagram that starts at each pertinent controller inside the shack, whether it's the rotor controller, whether it's a, a step IR controller, and traces it through all the cable harnesses all the way to the end. So this is our end-to-end -end map for all the control. And I've also thrown up an azimuth map. It helps me on being able to point the beam. One thing on that, uh, what I've got programmed in there is all the repeaters that I can hit with that 17 foot uh, 2 meter 440 antenna that's on top of the tower. Uh, UHF, VHF antenna. So it's 2 meter 440 and all the simplex frequencies mm -hmm. that I can find that were used in the local area. So that's kind of what uh, that radio is hooked to all the time. And you get the D star to it, D star frequency on it also. Excellent. Um, so the patch panel, uh, let me just re do a quick one. So you've got a red panel with three rows of holes. You've got a blue panel with three rows of holes. And the way they're oriented is, is like this. So, so here's, here's the block diagram down below where from a given radio, you go to the red panel with a loop back cable on the front down to the appropriate spot on the blue panel. Then inside the rack, we have an eight by one switch goes through an HF coupler and power meter, uh, through the MFJ tuner, through another switch, and off to the pertinent antenna. So the rows identify that cable. Like, for example, when you say um, there will be labels on here, they'll say for the 10 Tech Orion. Well, there will also be a label up here that says to the 10 Tech Orion. Well, this is the spigot that goes directly to the radio. This is the spigot that goes to that assignment on that 8x1 switch for that radio. So this is helping to tell where I am in this whole chain of connection. So again, leaving it as it is, you've got any one of the HF radios to any one of the HF antennas. You just walk up and on the desk next to the Orion is this switch box. So one rotary knob and you've, there's LEDs lighting them up, up above here. For which radio do I want to hook to which antenna? radio knob, antenna knob, and these switches down here are for the LNAs up on the tower and for the satellite LNAs as well to turn them on or off. Uh, additionally, we have a VHF horizontal beam and a VHF vertical beam up on the tower, and this is where you can switch between those two here as well. So this does all of the antenna switching, all of the radio switching, all in one box at the, uh, on, on one of the desks there inside the shack. Okay. <clears throat> so this bulkhead panel, which in the past I've shown looks, in the past looks like this, now looks like this, all, all pretty much well populated. Um, the chart that I showed earlier pointed to that's taped to the side of the rack gives RF feed line 1, RF 2, RF 3, RF 4. That corresponds to the names <laughs> on these ports on the outside of the building. And the, inside the shack, I also have each one of the feed lines labeled. So what this does for us is by having this patch panel on the outside of the building is that anytime we want to work on any of our equipment, we don't actually need access to the Jeep lab, which is a restricted access lab. Everything can be done either outside the building or inside the shack. Like I said, all feed lines are all labeled. Even I could figure it out. Okay. So now I'm going to spend several slides talking about the step IR controllers. And the reason why I'm going to spend a few slides on it is that they are not necessarily the most intuitive for if I want to do something like retract all the elements in, which is what you want to do when you're done using it. Um, there are two step IR controllers labeled for, the beam, for what they control, the beam and the vertical. Um, when you're shut shutting down, you always want to retract the elements. In other words, inside these, they have fiberglass radomes, thin fiberglass whips, that inside of it you have a beryllium copper tape that gets spooled up or down to tune it. Well, one, if it's left, like, so let's take the vertical for example. If, it's, if the tape is left up and then you shut the station off, there's no locking mechanism to hold it there. So when you turn the station back on next time, it has no idea where that tape is. So it's always a good idea, not only from lightning, a lightning protection safety standpoint, but also just for a where am I now standpoint that you always want to retract the elements when you're done. Um, 
For the vertical, it's pretty straightforward. You, uh, when you hit retract, it retracts the elements and then shuts off the controller. It's very straightforward. The step by our beam has an older style uh, controller. Charlie has mentioned that we want to get a newer style, but I'm going to go through how to control this to retract the elements uh, so that when you're done using it, you can pack it all away as needed. Okay. So this old style controller that we're using to control the step by our beam, when you're done operating, so when you're up and running, you'll notice over here that there's a mode button and there's three LEDs, amateur, general frequency, and setup. What I do is, if it's not already lit up, I keep pressing the mode button until the amateur light is lit up, and then these buttons are very straightforward, they just take you to that band. You can do fine tuning with the up and down key, you know, you can do like, I think it's like, uh, five kilohertz or 50 kilohertz steps to, to fine tune it, but in general you're going you're to be good if you're parked in the middle of the band. So when you're done operating, what you'll want to do on this one <clears throat> is you want to retract the elements. And so the way to do that is you press this mode button until the setup light is lit up. So retracting of the elements is a menu underneath the setup option. So you press and release the mode button until the setup LED is lit. And you, so once you um, are there, then you can hit the up and down arrows until it says retract elements. Because once you're in the setup menu, you're gonna have options to calibrate uh, or to retract the elements or go to factory defaults. Just keep hitting the up or down buttons to go through those options until it says retract elements, okay? So once you're there, you say, ah, retract elements is there, so you hit select, meaning I want to do that. And it's going to prompt you, are you sure this is what you wanna do? And what you're gonna see after that is a yes, and a no, one of them will be blinking. So again, up and down moves you between the choices. So keep hitting up or down until a yes is blinking and hit select to enter it and it'll go off and retract the elements. <clears throat> as it's retracting them, it's gonna let you know that it's still doing it because it will say retracting elements and there's an asterisk that keeps blinking. And with these controllers in general, if there's an asterisk blinking, it means I'm in the process of moving elements don't talk into me, don't transmit into me because I'm still spooling tape up and down. So once things start blinking and it's just a static display, you know it's set and ready to go. Now what retract elements does is it retracts the elements kind of, meaning when you fire it up, if, it's, if, it's, if it says it's set for 20 meters, it's gonna say, okay, I'm going to blindly assume that my copper tape is extended for 20 meters because the control of these out to the antenna, there's no feedback mechanism. It's just a one-way street uh, where it just sends pulses and gosh, I hope he gets it, okay? So all it does, it says, okay, assuming he's in the 20 meter position, how many clicks do I have to do on the stepper motor to bring it all the way in? And he just sends out that many clicks. Well, what happens if the tape isn't in that position? For the beam, that's why we have calibrate. So calibrate is really what you want to do if you're not sure if, it, if the elements have been left out or whatnot. And what calibrate does is it says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send pulses. I have no idea where the tapes are. So I'm going to send enough pulses that worst case, if they were all the way in, I'm now going to extend them all the way out. So now I know, I definitely know they're all the way out. The way. And then it'll come, bring, and then it sucks them all the way. It assumes you're oh, it goes back the other way? It sucks them all in and then moves them back out to whatever frequency. To whatever frequency you're at, okay. So thank you. Uh, so the calibrate, what it'll do is it sends enough of them to make sure it knows exactly where that tape is. And so it's always a good thing to hit because it's, it sends enough pulses to make sure that they're definitely sucked in before it spools them back out. Uh, so on this one, it's very similar to how you did it with the, uh, with the um, retract elements. Uh, you get into the setup mode and you hit the up down buttons until it says calibrate. You hit select and it's going to ask for a yes or no and one of those will be blinking. The option that's active will be blinking. You hit up and down so that the yes is blinking and you hit select again and it's off to the races. And again, while it's doing its thing, it gives you positive feedback on the display telling you what it's doing at that time. And when the display goes back to being static and there's nothing flashing on the, on the LCD display, it's all set to go. Now, Charlie, you said that's one of the things that we're looking at doing is actually replacing this controller with one that's similar to what the vertical has, right? That is correct. They will be replaced with that, so there will be a retract button. There is not a calibrate button. 
So you have to go through all those steps. If you get in there and the SWR is high, he said, well, I retracted it. No, no, it could be wrong. So if, if the SWR doesn't look right, go in and do the calibrate. You got to set up and all the steps he pointed out. Maybe you should print that out and post that yeah, outside. Yeah, cool. And uh, when it's calibrated, then, then it works well. <clears throat> but when we shut the when you turn the power off on these things, they trickle a little bit of power out there to hold the stepper motor. But when we turn it off, it's gone. We're killing the AC power to the controller right. itself. With the beam, because the elements kind of grew, the tape has a tendency to slide out and get long. With the vertical, it'll over time as the wind whips that thing back and forth, it has a yeah. tendency to, to draw back down. So short then. Yeah. So in either one, when it doesn't appear that your SWR is right, or if you walk in there and it's set on 7th May because somebody didn't do the retract, then you can probably figure out calibrating. All right. Work a whole lot better. Okay. So that's a, that's a quick overview on the usage of the, of the step IR uh, antennas. Um, Sliding down here, uh, we have an M the MFJ tuner. So when you're going through the switches, like I said, there's two, there's two elements that are in between the two 8x1 switches. There's a forward reverse power meter, and there's this MFJ tuner. Now, on, there's a switch right down here. That lets you, so if you look on the back of this, this basically has one port that says transmitter and a whole bunch of other ports that the transmitter is connected to depending on where you set the switch. So let it be known that we're using coax one, okay? There's nothing, so if you select coax two and you key up, you're going into an open. So coax one, which is where it's set, and there's two coax one settings. There's one called coax one and one called coax direct one. <laughs> and what that is, the direct one is a feed line straight through. There's no tuner in place whatsoever. So if you don't wanna operate the 75 meter dipole on 40 meters, you wanna use some, the resident antennas for what they're for, uh, straight up then just use the direct one and it's, it's, this just becomes a short piece of coax. And that's how it's normally set is to direct that's one. Set. Yep. Um, and the last thing that's in the rack here as far as what all the antennas go through is the power meter and HF coupler by array solutions. Now, so this display is setting up on the credenza right above the 10 tech Orion. Now, keep in mind, that this power meter is gonna be measuring the power of whichever transmitter you're using. So if I'm using the S line over here, the control head's gonna be over on a different desk. So this, this is not just the power of the 10 tech, it's the power of whichever radio is going through the switches at the time. But I find this handy for, for, uh, for tuning up because I have an instant read back, nice big numbers and easy to read. And this control head can be moved for a different view angle if needed, but that's sitting right above the, uh, the 10 tech radio. Um, that in a nutshell is the operations of the station. So I didn't go over any of the operations of the actual radios themselves. If anyone does want help with that, get a hold of me and I'll either answer your questions or make it up and sound like I know what I'm talking about. But uh, so I'm, I'm willing to give anybody a tour, get them checked out, you know, get your not yep. card, But other than actually operating the radios, this will get you hooked up to an antenna and get an antenna tuned. Like I said, we have two tunable antennas, the step IR vertical and the step IR beam, okay? Uh, moving on, okay. So Charlie asked me to put together a little bit we, uh, concerning the flex, flex radio. The Flex 6700 is the Cadillac, the top of the line of the flex offerings right now. Um, it is a direct sample, direct generation transceiver. In other words, there's no mixer. They just have an A to D converter sampling HF or six meters as the case may be. And they have a DAC gen directly generating that same signal. So other than a couple of amplifiers and some barn door big filters, maybe some band specific like 20 meter, 40 meter filters, that's it. No mixers, no crystal filters, it's straight off you go. Um, and this thing has been given good reviews, and for good reason, on their, what, what, I'm, what I'm going to call co-site performance from an amateur radio perspective, not necessarily co-site performance of what the US DOD considers co-site. Um, so I wanted to see how well it stacked up to some of our standard mill, mill standard RF test, testing requirements, so we measured one in the lab. 
And what I focused on were these three parameters here. Receive desense, that's when I'm trying to receive a weak signal in the presence of a strong interferer. Receive intermod distortion, that's where I have two guys at just the right frequency offsets that any distortion products would cause an interferer on channel. And transmit spurious and broadband noise. And what I did is I put them in the context of, well, out of the box, how close is this thing to our mill standard 188-141C, which is our current standards that we're, our feet are held to the fire on in government systems for our HF radios. So we measured one. Before you go on, uh, went down to the Eastern Iowa DX Association Hall. Uh-huh. Then when they went down to Paul Myron, they snuck one of these down there. It was supposed to be totally yeah. an L-craft um, expedition. And they had one of these, oh, they're so thrilled. It just doesn't matter how close you get. The noise floor never rises. They're, right. You can't overload it. So the hams are pretty excited about this. And so we were wondering, okay, how, does, how well does it really work given right. the same criteria? Yeah. Yep. So that's what we did. Um, now, one thing I wanted to mention here, to get a true test of it, okay, so the Flux 6700, the way it works, is that if you have a, for a given band that you're in, it, ha it does have a pre-selector in it. There is a filter that just, say you're operating 20 meters, just passes 14.2 and, you know, the whole band and gets rid of 40 meters and gets rid of 10. So, but you can set this thing up when receiving to operate what they call wide band mode. It can be a general purpose out of the hand bands, but in the HF band somewhere between 2 to 30 receiver. And that's what I did because what that does is it gets rid of that pre-selector filter and now I'm doing an apples to apples comparison with a lot of our HF radio products that we have in government systems. Uh, a side note, you know, cases where we do have a co-site requirement, the only way that you can functionally get that is you have to add another box. You have to add a pre-post selector in front of it, which we do all the time. But like for our airborne, a lot of our airborne HF comms, I wanted to do a, a straight up comparison against it. Nope, so the only, so the only well, there's one pre-selector on this. It's a 50 megahertz low pass, which is functionally what we have on our radios anyway. We have a 30 megahertz low pass. So it's DC to 50 meg comes screaming through and hits the A to D converter after being amplified. But that's, that's what the Collins radios have also. They Correct. Have a no, not, not for airborne. Mm -mm. Okay. Now, if someone really wants one and they want to pay the money, here, sure, you bet. Well, we sell them and yeah. not a problem. Well, uh, Right, and the pre-selectors I'm talking about there are tunable. That's what makes them a little costly. There's three or four pole filters that are, that are tunable that'll give you uh, 40 dB of selectivity at 5% offset. You know, they're ni nice, nice filters, but not cheap. Okay, so straight up, non co uh what is my desense requirement? Well, per the mill standard, I, I find sensitivity, 10 dB sine add, minimum de detectable signal with the desired, and I take an interferer, 5% offset in frequency, 100 dB up from that. And I'm allowed to degrade my sensitivity by 1 dB. <laughs> one, so I go from a 10 dB sine add to a 9 dB sine add. That's it, okay? Um, now, the clo now, obviously, you know, common sense sta states, and, and this is true for, for all your super hat radios out there, that the, where this is most difficult to be met is at the low end of the band because at the low end of the band, two megahertz, that's where 5% is the closest in. 5% of two megahertz is 100 kilohertz. 5% at 30 meg is one and a half megahertz away. So all of these, so all, you'll find a lot of our, in our HF radio designs and government systems is always focusing on 100 kilohertz offset because if I can meet that, things only get better the further away it, the interferer is, okay? Now, in a super heterodyne receiver, the thing that's going to rule the roost and basically make or break you is the, how clean the LO is because sideband noise will take this swamp and interfere and, and mix it on channel and kill your sensitivity. Um, it's called reciprocal mixed descents. Okay, now the number that you need to hit, the magic number, to make one, one dB descents with an interfere that high up is minus 150 dBc per hertz at 100 kilohertz offset. So if you want to gauge, I think a lot of the... Um, Oh, what are the standard tests they do for the amateur gear? The name they give to the, oh, you mean the to suite of tests. You said oh, yeah. Sherwood. Sherwood, yeah. So I think some of the Sherwood tests, I think, measure phase noise or at least maybe noise floor, I think. I can't re recall. Okay, so there's something you can compare it against. Okay, so, and this is what we do with our radio. So how good does a direct sample radio, in other words, the Flex 6700, how well does it do? Well, I took it. 
And, I got, and to where I got one dB of desense was with the interferon up 107 dB. So it made it with 7 dB of margin to spare. <clears throat> Pretty good. But then I started thinking about it, and that was where the A to D converter started clipping. Now, to make this a true test, you can make or break this however you want, because in the flex, you can set the, the, the LNA gain as high or as low as you want. So what I did is I adjusted the LNA gain so that its sensitivity matched what our radios typically did, which is around minus 115 dBm, minus 113, minus 1 dBm tend to be cyanide. So then I've got an apples and apples comparison. Here's what our radio sensitivity is, shipping. Here's where its desense performance is, how well does it do? So this was under the same conditions. So I adjusted its gain until its sensitivity was minus 113, minus 115 dBm. And I was able to crank the interferer up 107 dB before I got one dB of desense, and it was the A to D converter clipping because it went from no desense, no desense, no desense, 12 dB of desense. Because as, as, as soon as you start clipping the A to D converter, you, it goes quick. Um, now, by comparison, now this number, for anybody who's ever done synthesizer design at this close of an offset, that is a non trivial thing to do, especially if you want to make it relatively fast hopping. Fast, in, in my definition here, is one millisecond tune time being able to go from 2 to 30 megahertz in one millisecond and locked, um, which we do. We do that with, in conjunction with this phase noise. Well, if you put this in terms of effective, think of it as a reciprocal mix type of performance, that's as if the flex has a minus 157 dBc per hertz LO, which is unbelievably clean. Now, its actual clock is much cleaner than that. I'm just talking it's functionally that's how clean it is as if it were reciprocal mixed desense, which it's not. It's a different phenomenon that's causing the desense. It's clipping. Uh, but like I said, 7 dB better than spec, so that's pretty good. Now, the other nice thing is frequency offset is irrelevant. Now, if you think about it with a super het design, you get that interfering 100 kilohertz away. OK, I'm making my spec. If it gets further away, it, my desense performance gets better and better because the noise keeps rolling off. If I bring the interferer in, it gets worse and worse because that noise shelf on my LO is getting higher. This guy, I can park him right up next to it and I still have 107 dB of dynamic range because it's irrelevant because the digital filters are going to knock the crud out of him within reason. I mean, you can't move it into 3.00001 kilohertz away and, and be good. But you can bring this in 50 kilohertz offset, 20 kilohertz offset, and it's still doing good. In fact, in fact you can bring it into the point where the noise of the interferer's transmitter is covering up your channel, where I would have been fine. I am accurately receiving his noise. Because if he gets in close enough, he's going to have noise sidebands, and they're going to land on channel, right? So, but in general, the frequency offset is irrelevant, which is really nice, because now all of a sudden I can hit 100 kilohertz offset descent no matter where I'm tuned. So could that ADC clipping be ameliorated by adding more bits? Yes, yes, it can, uh, it, it can be. It, it can, but the phenomenon I'm about to talk to is not necessarily a one for one pickup. You do pick up some. Yeah, but now keep in mind these A to D converters uh, that they're using are probably 